Being Your Best with Trey Johnson. Changing the world, one thought at a time. Well, let's, let's get right into the Word tonight. If you were here last time, uh, you know, we, were, we, we went over Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. And it's when Jesus told the disciples, let's cross over to the other side. And as they were crossing over to the other side, this big storm came about. And we went through it and we looked at it, how the disciples were focused on the waves. But Jesus took dominion and authority over the wind. And then he spoke to the waves. And how the enemy a lot of times wants us focus on the waves instead of taking our dominion and authority over the evil spirits that are assigned to bring the destruction in our life. And we saw how the, the evil spirits, it, it's just like it painted a picture of a personality that was picking up the waves and was targeting Jesus' ship because the enemy did not want Jesus and the disciples to get to the other side because on the other side was the madman of Gadara. And once he was delivered, he went and he reached 10 regions all for the glory of God. And so whatever storm you're facing, you will get to the other side. Say it, I will get to the other side. And then we, we touched on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And this is where I want us to kind of pick up tonight because this is such powerful... Uh, scripture, this is Paul talking to Timothy, and Timothy is kind of having a meltdown. You know, he's pastoring the biggest church in the world at that time, and they had seen the power of God move in this church. People were coming into the church, miracles, signs, wonders. But then during this time, Nero, uh, who was the emperor at that time, he flipped his wig. He was twisted anyway, but he burned down part, part of Rome, and then he blamed it on the Christians. And so then at this time, the Roman soldiers were coming in to people's house, Christian's house, and they were taking them out. They were either hanging them up on a pole, kind of like our light poles. They light up the town, the city. This is what they would do with Christians. They would hang them on the pole and they would tort, set them on fire. And so Timothy did not know whether the next knock at the door was going to be a Roman soldier coming to pull him out to either stone, stone him Flame him with a knife or burn him alive. And so Timothy was not in prison. Paul was in prison. And Timothy writes to the man in prison and he says, I need help. And so this is the mindset that Paul is writing back to Timothy because Timothy is he's letting fear consume him. He's kind of withdrawn on his calling, his assignment because of the storms that he was facing in life. And so Paul writes to Timothy, we pick it up in verse 3. He says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone compete in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And so notice how Paul, he points to a good soldier. He points to an athlete and he points to a hardworking farmer. And so he uses words just like in today's society. If I say the word football, I don't have to sit up here and talk to you about what football is for 15 minutes because you understand what football is. So when Paul uses the word a good soldier, he didn't have to explain what a good soldier was. He says, Timothy, I need you to get your head back in the game. Timothy, I need you to remember who enlisted you because when it uses the phrase enlisted you, we want to please the one who enlisted you. They would have scouts that would go out the land for the athletes and the soldiers and they would watch how they worked out. They would watch how they performed. They would watch their mindset. They would watch their approach to life and they would enlist them to come and sign up for, for the Roman, uh, to be a Roman soldier or to be a professional athlete. And so he's saying, Timothy, I need you to realize you're not the only one fighting a fight here. 
I need you to realize that, yeah, you might have it tough, but everybody has it tough. So I need you to get your head back in the game and remember who called you, remember who wired you, remember who designed you, that God has not changed his mind about what he put on the inside of you. I need you to have the mindset of a good soldier. And a good soldier is not looking to get out. A good soldier is looking to get in. A good soldier is not barely looking to get by. A good soldier is reporting for duty with the mindset, I'm going to do whatever it takes to fulfill the assignment that I have in front of me. And so this is what Paul is telling Timothy. I need you to remember who enlisted you. I need you to remember what God has spoken to you and get back in the game and be a good soldier. Say it, good soldier. And he says, and if you don't get that picture, Timothy, then I need you to think about a professional athlete. They had the amateur athletes and they had the professional athletes. And he says, Timothy, I need you to remember when you signed up to be in the family of God, to be in the army of God, you were called to have a professional mindset and not a mindset of an amateur. Because see, an amateur thinks different than a professional. An amateur at this time, they would have these uh, places which were called a palestry, a big coliseum where all these, the boxers, the wrestlers, the pancreatus, where they would work out, where they would train, And an amateur would come up and they would have posted on the wall who was training that day and what the fighting schedule looked like that day. And an amateur would come up and he would look, okay, oh, that guy, he might kick my tail. And so I'm probably not going to train today. And they would turn and go the other way. But a professional never looked at the fight that was ahead of them. They did not care who they were fixing to get in the ring with because they trained themselves for such a time as this. A professional athlete did not look at how difficult it was going to be. They showed up with the intention, I'm going to leave it all on the field. I'm going to give it all I have. And they would go through a training process. They had rooms set up and they would come through one room and they'd strip off all their clothes and they would lay down on this table and they would have trainers that would rub oil into their body. And then they would get up and they would go into a different room where another trainer uh, would show them how to, to use their weapons, how to, use, how to fight like a warrior. So a professional Christian should have a different mindset than an amateur. And I believe that God is raising up children of God that have a mindset, I know there's going to be battles, but I have an assignment to fulfill. I know there's going to be difficult times, but I'm not going to think like a loser. I'm not going to believe like a loser. I'm not going to talk like a loser. Some way, somehow, my God will show up. I'm going to think win, believe win, talk win. I'm going to train like a winner, and I don't care what I have to face. I am going to learn how to use my equipment all for the glory of God. And this is what Paul was telling Timothy, and this is what God is telling you and I. Do you have a mindset of an amateur, or do you have a mindset of a professional? Do you have a mindset of a good soldier that is reporting for duty? Whatever you've created me to do, whatever you've called me to do, your word is your word, your plan is your plan. Just because things change, just because people change, God never changes. His word never changes. His plan for your life never changes. Yes, it might look different. It might look a little longer. I look a little shorter, but God's plan for our life never changes. But it takes the right mindset to walk in the things of God. You cannot be a weenie and walk in the things of God. That's Johnson paraphrase. That's really not scripture or anything, but you get the picture, right? And he says, okay, Timothy, a good soldier, an athlete. He says, how about the hardworking farmer? Because a hardworking farmer knows he's called to a certain field. A hardworking farmer understands there's going, to be, there's going to be weather that you have to deal with. A hardworking farmer understands there's going to be insects that come and they try to steal the word from your soil, but a hardworking farmer is going to do whatever it takes to protect the field that it's called to. And a hardworking farmer will plow as long as he has to plow and he will sow seed as long as he has to sow seed because it, that is his field and he will continue to sow and he will continue to pull the weeds out and he'll continue to cultivate and he'll do whatever it takes because his family is counting on harvest to come up in the field that he's called to. And this is what Paul is talking to Timothy about. He says, Timothy, I need you to get to your field. I need you to get to the people you're called to. I need you to use your gifts and your callings all for the glory of God. It might take longer. It might be more difficult. There might be some battles. But Timothy, you get in the field and you keep sowing and you keep watering. And somewhere during this time, 
what would happen, one of the, the most dreaded insects, I guess they're an insect, I don't, know if, I don't think they're in the bird family, would be the locusts. I mean, they're as big as birds sometimes, but you know. And the locusts would come in. And at this time, the farmers did not have the ability to stop the locusts. And the locusts could eat 90 miles of vegetation in one day. And so they had spent their whole season sowing the seed, getting the harvest to come up, and the locusts would not show up when they planted the seed. The locusts would not show up in the middle of the growth. The locusts would only show up right before harvest. And so somewhere during the process, the farmers learned that if I build a fire, the smoke would be released and it would suffocate and kill the locusts. I know you're getting a lot out of the teaching, but I want to encourage you to go to the website, TreyJohnsonMinistries.com, and order your copy of this teaching today. You know, each and every one of us, it takes several times of us hearing something for it to become a revelation to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. You know, I know that you're sharp. I know that you're intelligent. And I know God spoke to you about a lot of different things during this teaching. But order the product. While you're there, don't forget I have several books that I've written. You can order a copy of the magazine there. You can sign up for leadership development. I do every Wednesday morning. If you can't be on, you can listen to the recording. You know, I'm an executive director for the John Maxwell organization. And so I do leadership teachings all around the country. And it's something that I believe will add value to your life. If you're hungry about growth, if you're wanting to lift your thinking, lift your believing, if you're wanting to develop in your business, in your ministry, just in life as a housewife, as a husband, whatever it is, God has greater things in store for you. And it takes the right people speaking into our life to help us discover everything we're called and created to do. And while you're there, don't forget to pray about becoming a partner with the ministry. You know, Heather and I are traveling around the country. The show's going around the world. And every person that's saved, healed, delivered, you're a part of that. It takes partners just like you to get in connection with us, to believe God with us, and for us to take new territories for the kingdom of God. TreyJohnsonMinistries.com, and we would enjoy hearing from you. This is where we pick it up in Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. This is God speaking through the prophet Joel. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, and my great army, which I set among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. So you can see from the very beginning, it is always God's heartbeat for us to walk in our harvest. It is always God's design. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first, the last. He already went to the end of our life and He saw the fields we're called to. He, he saw the assignments that we have and He expects us to fulfill the assignment like a good soldier. He expects us to fulfill the assignment like a professional athlete. He expects us to fulfill the assignment like a hardworking farmer. And even though there might be locusts, He is expecting you and I to learn how to build the fire and release the smoke. Think about it. How can I build the fire and release the smoke? Because when I learn how to keep my fire built and burning bright, it releases smoke and Satan cannot take the harvest that I'm called to. He cannot stop me from walking in the field that I'm designed to walk in. But if I let the fire go out, there's not enough people around you to stop the enemy from stopping you from being who God's called and created you to be. 
But if we can learn how to stir the fire and release the smoke, the devil might come, Satan might come, and he will come as long as you're on this earth. But he does not win. He does not get our harvest. He does not get the field. He does not stop us from walking in everything God has designed us to walk in. So we've got to learn how to stir the fire and release the smoke. Look at your neighbor and say, stir the fire. Look at your other neighbors and say, release the smoke. So think about whenever you're building a fire. We have a fireplace at the house and everything. And, and you know, you, you put pieces of wood on the fire. And, and the thing about if they saw a large swarm of locusts coming in, they'd build a big fire. That would release a lot of smoke. But if it was a small swarm, they would make a little fire that released a little bit of smoke. So if you're in a big attack, you're going to need to build a big fire that's going to release a lot of smoke. If it's not that big, you still should have a fire going at all times that releases smoke, letting the devil know you've jacked with the wrong person, letting the enemy know you will not get my harvest, you will not get my kids' harvest, you will not get my family's harvest. You've jacked with the wrong person because I know how to build the fire and release the smoke. Say it, stir the fire, release the smoke. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Now I want you to picture, if I'm going to build a fire, there, it, it comes by putting pieces of wood on there. right? What are the ingredients of building a fire? So I, I, I got to learn how to put logs on. And the, the, the main fuel to a fire is always the Word of God. It is always the Word of God. Say it, the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. This is Paul writing to Timothy again. He says, Therefore, I would remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. In the Amplified Classic, it says, That is why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flame, keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you. Notice the word stir up. It means to be enthusiastic. It means to be fervent, passionate, vigorous, to do something wholeheartedly or zealous, to rekindle or to stir back to life again. And Paul was telling Timothy, so in verse 5, he says, Timothy, I know where you came from. He says, I knew your mom, I knew your grandmother, and I knew the reality of their faith and the same faith that they walk in is the same faith that you walk in. When they prayed, things happened. It wasn't none of this, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It wasn't, Lord, bless my parakeet and my donkey. It was, no, when we pray, things happen. And he says, now, Timothy, I need you to go back and I need you to learn to stir yourself up again. I need you to bring it back to life again. When he's talking about the gracious gift of God, he's talking about, Timothy, I need you to go back and remember what all salvation means to you. It doesn't mean that you're just going to heaven, but it means that the greater one is on the inside of you. It means you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It means that you are holy because of the blood of Jesus. It means that his word was sent to you. He wired you. He graced you. He designed you to be something special. Timothy, I need you to go back. And if it's gone down, and if it's just embers, I need you to begin to blow on the embers again. I begin to, if you can just find one little flame, and if you're born again, child of God, maybe the life has just poured a bucket of water on your fire, but there's still something burning on the inside of you. And if you'll learn how to position yourself where the word is the number one ingredient and you begin to poke it and you begin to fan it and you begin to stir it up, the fire will come back. Learn to stir the fire and release the smoke. Say it, stir the fire, release the smoke. So he says, Timothy, I need you to stir, to keep burning that inner fire, that gracious gift. Jeremiah 23, verse 29 And we're talking about the Word of God is the main ingredient to keep the fire of God burning in our life. He says, Is not my word like fire that consumes all that cannot endure the test, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance? Notice what he says. Is not my word like fire? Is not my word like fire? 
Jeremiah 20, verse 9 in the Amplified, it says, For if I say I will not make mention of the Lord or speak any more in His name, my mind and my heart, it is as if there were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of enduring and holding it in. I cannot contain it any longer. He isn't talking about just a churchgoer. He's saying, I'm positioned myself and I try, maybe I try not to open my mouth. Maybe I try not to go forward and declare what God is saying. But the word of God is like fire and it's shut up in my bones. And there comes to a point that I can't help myself. I've got to open my mouth and tell the devil he's nothing. I've got to open my mouth and declare the works of God. He says, my word is like fire and whatever is in its way, it's going to consume it up. It's going to begin to burn. It's going to begin to burn the debris. It's going to begin to make new ways and new path, but it is from an intimate relationship with the Word of God. Not just carrying our Bible, not just going to church, not just singing Christian music. It's when the fire of God, the Word of God comes from the heart of God, the mouth of God into my heart, and it becomes a reality to me. It becomes real to me that God's Word, there's something on the inside of each and every one of us that bears witness. There's more to walking with God than going to church. There is more than just blessing my food. There is more. You know why there is more on the inside? Why you desire more? Because there is more. And Jeremiah says the word of God, it is like fire shut up in my bones. There has to be some fire about us in order to put the enemy in his place. There has to be some fire about us to get back up when life knocks us down. There has to be some fire in us to walk in the restoration that God has designed us to walk in. Say it, fire. Luke chapter 24, verse 31 through 32. Now what's happened here? After Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he was resurrected. Mary Magdalene, she, you know, went around and said, Jesus is alive, went and told all the disciples. And so here you have two disciples, they're walking on the road to Emmaus. This is after Jesus was resurrected. And when their eyes were instantly opened, because when Jesus showed up to them, they didn't recognize it was Jesus. He just starts talking to them. But when their eyes were instantly open and they clearly recognized him, he vanished, departed invisibly, and they said to one another, were not our hearts greatly moved and burning within us while he was talking with us on the road as he opened and explained to us the sense of the scripture? Notice the word burn means to ignite, to set on fire, to burn, to be consumed with a burning blaze. He said, didn't whenever God spoke to me, when Jesus was speaking to us, it ignited our heart? See, there's a difference between just hearing the Word of God and hearing the anointed Word of God. There's a difference between playing church and going after God. There's a difference between being religious and really being a person that I want to know the mind of God, the heart of God. Why does He do what He do? What's on His motive? What's His heart? What's His intent? And they said, when He began to speak, it burned on the inside of us. It ignited something. It lit something on the inside of us. Stir the fire and release the smoke. Let's keep going. James chapter 3. When you think of, of what a fire does, you think you have a, uh, maybe it's a, a, you know, in high school and stuff, we'd have a bonfire, or maybe you'd build a fire out if you're hunting or something like that, and if the fire wasn't tended to, it would eventually go out. And you think of what a fire does. A fire, it puts off heat. A fire can burn stuff up. A fire can melt stuff if you throw it in there. A fire lights stuff up. Listen to what James tells us in James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. He's talking about the power of our tongue. And he says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the word it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. And so he's talking about a tongue that is unsurrendered to the Holy Spirit. How we can speak a word and it's, it's influenced by hell and it just burns up a whole, a whole situation. It makes it bigger than what it should be. Have you ever experienced that before? The power of words. Proverbs 18, 21, the power of life and death is in the tongue. So if a tongue that is unsurrendered to God, that is influenced by hell, can set on fire the course of nature, a tongue surrendered to the Holy Spirit 
can set on fire the course of your life. When you begin to receive the Word of God and speak the Word of God, it can burn up. Think of what a fire does. It can burn up the debris. Have you ever burnt brush and stuff like that? You know how you can light it on fire and you can watch it. All the dead stuff, I mean, it just burns it up. And what's remaining is it is just the stumps and just the trees or just certain things. Well, when the Word of God starts to really penetrate our heart, it begins to burn up old ways of thinking. I want to pray over you. Father, I love you so much. And I'm thankful for all the assignments represented here in this room that are watching. Every gift, every calling, every assignment. Father, I just ask that right now, wherever each and every one of us are at, that things are beginning to stir. There's a hunger, there's a thirst, there's a passion for the presence of God. There's a hunger for freedom, for deliverance, for healing, for restoration, for reconciliation. That, Father, there are individuals watching that have never made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. If they were to die today, they would go straight to hell because they've never asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. So, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to move upon their heart. And if that's you, if I'm talking to you, I want you to pray this very simple prayer right where you're sitting, standing, wherever you're hearing this around the world. And as you pray this prayer and you believe this in your heart, and you declare this with your mouth, right where you're sitting or standing, the life of God enters you, and you come out of the kingdom of darkness and come into the family of Jesus Christ, and you can be certain that you'll spend eternity with Almighty God. Can we pray this together out loud? Can we say, Father God, today is the day that I make the decision to believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead to give me life. And right now, I accept that life. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. And according to God's Word, I am forgiven. I am now saved, and I can be certain that I'll spend eternity with Almighty God. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want you to to call the number on the screen. We want you to go to the website, TreyJohnsonMinistries.com. Let us know about the decision that you just made. We want to help you get connected, first and foremost, to God, help you grow in your relationship through our podcast, our daily devotionals, all the different teachings that we have available. But we will do our best to try to help find a Bible teaching church in an area close to where you live. Remember, there's no perfect church. But we need the church in order to grow. It's the palestry. It's the training grounds for you and I to be everything we're called and created to be. So make sure, this is very important, make sure the church that you're going to, they're teaching you how to win. They're challenging you. They're not petting your flesh. They're equipping you to be last day warriors, lights, burning bright, victorious people, children of God. You're made in the image of likeness of God. This is Trey Johnson. We love you. We believe in you. Until next week, God bless you guys. I want to encourage you to go to the website, TreyJohnsonMinistries.com, and order this teaching today. You know, our belief is changed by repetition. Our thinking is changed by repetition. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's why we put these teachings in CD forms or in flash drive forms so we can listen to them over and over and over again. Get up listening to them. Go to bed listening to them. Get it in you. When life squeezes you, the Word is what's going to come out of you. TreyJohnsonMinistries.com. Get your order today.